Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and welcome to City Conversations. I'm Michael Alexander, the director of SFU City Conversations. We welcome you all uh, to this conversation. How many people have not been to a city conversation before? A few of you. Okay, well, uh, first of all, let me say that we are uh, on unceded territory of the Salish Nations, and we thank them uh, for this courtesy. Um, here's the way city conversations work. We do not have speakers, and we do not have an audience. Instead, we have presenters, and we have participants, and you are the participants. This time is primarily for your questions, your observations, uh, your opinions. Uh, it's a conversation back and forth. It can be across, uh, if, if you feel it's, that somebody, another participant has said something that uh, you want to reinforce or disagree with, you can make that point. Uh, uh, as well. Uh, oh, first of all, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Supervisor Adrian Carr, who is uh, joining the council. council. I could supervise if you like. San Francisco. And that's absolutely true. Are there any other elected officials in the room today? Yes, sir. You are? Park, Park Board Commissioner Casey Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Crawford. Um, and I also want to acknowledge, uh, and you'll understand now why I'm uh, why I switched to my San Francisco roots. Uh, Mark Manis, who is in the back here, who uh, came up from San Francisco last night to talk to a, uh, a public uh, gathering about uh, the viaducts and San Francisco's experience in taking down uh, its. Uh, it's elevated uh, freeways, uh, so we welcome you, uh, Clark. If you're tweeting, it's uh, hashtag city.com. And today's conversation is on politics and planning. This is the second of three events. The first one was two days ago. It was by invitation. It was at City Hall. It was put on by uh, UPC. Uh, UBC's uh, School of Planning and uh, uh, of City Planning uh, uh, start, and uh, the Vancouver Public, uh, uh, sorry, the Vancouver City Planning Commission. Uh, that will be online shortly. This, uh, uh, this gathering today will also be online uh, uh, shortly as soon as we have uh, the tape up. Uh, so, if you do not wish to be photographed uh, uh, during the conversation, just raise your hand now so that we, uh, so that, uh, the videographer knows not to point the camera. Everybody's cool. Great. Today we're going to talk about politics and planning. What's the relationship between council and the city planning uh, director? Of which uh, of whom we are about to get a new one because the old one is retiring. Uh, what are the what are what's the relationship? Who makes what decisions? Who gives what advice? What do planners learn from council? What do councilors learn from planners? Those are some of the questions we want to explore today. And to do so, we have. Uh, uh, we're very thankful to have uh, two former uh, uh, counselors, uh, Marguerite Ford. Peter Ladner. In my view, the premier uh, journalist in, uh, in British Columbia, Francis Peter. So, uh, Mark, you're going to start? Uh, to start with, I think I'm here under Paul's pretenses a bit because I didn't have to, have to hire a planner. 
I was elected after the, the first team council and they had everything in place um, to start with, so I benefited from their wisdom. Uh, and their choice of planner. They, the choice of planner really matters because the, the, the type of city, the planner decides to a large degree what kind of city. Planning is important because the, the design of cities decides to some degree the kind of people that live there. I always used to say, if Paris didn't have the boulevards, would Paris have a fashion industry? If you didn't have the whole large to be seen and the sea and be seen, and um, Paris got a fashion industry, New York got a garment industry. Is that because the cities were different? One one of the things that a, a director of planning is going to need to know is is, is, is what makes cities, how planning affects the kind of city, how cities work. Lots of planners are good at how cities look, but how they work is, is to me very important. And in selecting a new uh, planner, the uh, council is going to have to choose a person who fits their ideas, and hopefully they have been able to express what those ideas are to the public, so the public knows what they're likely to be getting. Um, and it's the job of the council to inform the public and bring them along if necessary. Uh, and if they don't bother to do that, there's a, going to be a lot of unhappiness and turmoil. And the mayor has to provide the leadership. It's, it's rare that a, a council member has much interest or, or uh, even knowledge of planning. Uh, not everybody is a Walter Hardwick who did have. But in any case, the mayor has to provide the leadership. And it, it has to be a partnership with the, the new director of planning. I think that's very important. And, and the mayor and, and council have to articulate what it is they're trying to do. They have to make sure people understand. And if it, it involves change from what people are used to, that takes quite a lot of time and and. Um, really serious consultation because people don't change their ideas very readily and it's not true that they don't change their ideas at all and a, a lot of people just say oh it's an NB so that we won't pay any attention but people are entitled to know what's going on and and uh, the director of planning of course has to put that kind of change into context so that it's understandable so it's actually workable, and so it does what is intended and not something something uh, different. Um, there, a lot of it takes a lot of negotiation and, and public consultation. I think that's very important. And particularly, I do not think that having an open house with a fancy bunch of nice posters does the job. Mm -hmm. It takes longer than that. Um, and I think it's uh, it's very important that council and and that the planning department and the director of planning work together and do their own job. It's, it's not up to the council members to do the planning, and it's not up to the, the uh, director of planning to do the politics, which sometimes happens. So you, you have to be um, very clear in what it is you're trying to do and how you're trying to do it. Um, there are a lot of duties that the director of planning will have to have. Uh, but I think I mean, nobody has mentioned metro planning recently, but it, that's a very <coughs> important element because if almost always when the region has been affected, there's been leadership from Vancouver. So both the, the mayor and the planning department have to be involved. Um, Otherwise, we're going to get an awful lot of sprawl, which affects Vancouver without Vancouver being able to do anything about it. And to, to, to accomplish any of the planning objectives, it's up to council to have the proper legislative framework in place to do uh, so that the, the, the planning department can do what they need to do. Um, and if the uh, director of planning will have to uh, have some, uh, I, I guess you would say autonomy 
And along those lines, I, I dug up a quote from Art Phillips' original uh, inaugural address in 1973, and he says, department heads should be given more independence and they should in turn assign more responsibility and authority to staff members throughout the civil service. I would like to see a general relaxation throughout the city staff where individual employees will feel freer to make judgments, offer suggestions, and bring about changes to the operations of City Hall. That's spoken by a man with confidence because not all politicians will feel that way. <laughs> And, and I think that's great. So if, it, if, it's, if I were to hire the new director of planning, I would uh, look for someone who is well trained and has experience in a, with the city, um, who is uh, a good communicator, a good administrator to administrate his, own, his or her own department, um, um, good at, at public participation, um, uh, understands planning principles well and can communicate them to the public and to council and to do a little education of council members, which is usually needed. Uh, in other words, not be able to walk on water, but look as though we could. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Peter Rogers, you are on. Uh, thanks, Marguerite. Uh, just you mentioned Art Phillips, 1972, was it? 1973. 1973 uh, inaugural address. If if you really want to see the mark of a really outstanding mayor, read that document. It's unbelievable. He laid everything out that he was going to do in his term. Who would do it? All the details, like a business and plan. And then he did it. And he did it all. And he was only there for four years. It's it was incredible. quite remarkable how he transformed the city starting with that plan, all thought out before he sat down in this first meeting. Well, I'm just going to throw a few kind of anecdotes out there. Um, I'm not going to be quite as systematic as Marguerite and no doubt Francis will be. Um, I want to just... <laughs> she makes up her notes here. Uh, I, want to, I want to start with just a, my personal experience as a member of council during the hiring of Brent Totter, the previous planner, to Brian Jackson. And just to give an idea of the real politics of it, and I remember being called into the city manager's office one day and we were told, we knew that planning, that Larry Beasley had leave, was leaving, I had left, and we needed a new planner. And uh, in camera meeting, we were just told, kind of told, we got somebody. Uh, we got this great guy, you're gonna love him, and um, we don't really have anybody else. Uh, there's a few other people, but they weren't really. So it's basically a take it or leave it kind of thing. <laughs> to this day, I don't know who made that choice, whether and how much the mayor was consulted. Probably had another meeting earlier than the one with the council. But we just really didn't have much say. I think Larry Beasley had a lot to do with it. I think the city manager had a lot to do with it. And uh, who knows who else. And then right after we approved the person, I started getting these phone calls. Do you know what you guys did? Do you know who this guy is? Do you know how hated he was in Calgary by all the development community? <laughs> No, nope, I didn't know that. And so I was calling Calgary, what's going on? And then I finally came to the conclusion that he was probably hated to the extent that he was because he stuck up for principles of city planning ahead of the interests of the developers who weren't used to that. So I took that as an okay sign. But there were almost emergency meetings at UDI about how do we get rid of this guy, how can we stop him from coming in here. So that's one of the realities of the city planner. I'm going to go just through a few things that the city planner has to deal with, the director of planner planning. Um, and one is pressure from developers who uh, provide financial pressure. They finance city politicians, basically, pretty much entirely. Um, there is political pressure that they apply, they lobby heavily. They have people, some of them may even be in this room, who are expert at lobbying council behind the scenes. And they also have a, a kind of a compelling presence because they have expertise. They, they know what it costs to build these things. They know the reality of trying to do different things that the city might want done, but they know it can or cannot be done. Um, city planner health has to deal with all the past plans. And I went through just a few. There are so many. And uh, City Plan was just sort of the grandmother of them all from 1995, which was done, uh, I think it was Gordon Campbell who originally said, let's get this thing going, get the citizens to come up with these ideas. I printed out a few of the highlights. It goes on for a few pages. 
But it was only supposed to work for 20 years, so it's gone. It's out of date, but it's still hovering in the background. Then there are all these neighborhood plans. There's the bird uh, accommodation plan. There's the green roof plan. There's the laneway housing plan. It's a miracle that anybody could come to some sense with all this sometimes overlapping and conflicting plans. The city planner has to work also to think about the city's revenues. The city has become increasingly dependent on community amenity contributions, development costs, charges, to finance all kinds of infrastructure and things. And unfortunately, that is a factor in decision making and planning. The, the planner has to protect the public interest, but the question becomes, which public? The ones who show up and make a noise at council meetings or at neighborhood participation meetings, or the ones who sign on to play speak and participate in online polling, the ones who have um, actually ideas that we're just sorry we're not going to listen to. I don't want that social housing in my neighborhood. I don't care what you say. And they can show up 90% at the public meeting and we just go ahead and say we're having it anyway because it's a council policy. The person has to be good at listening and reaching out. Uh, as Marguerite said, a great communicator, being able to go to the neighborhoods, listen, explain, show how the ideas are going to fit into their neighborhood. Um, has to deal with the regional perspective because we are part of a larger region which forces us or we've agreed to take on so many people in the growth of the region and there's no stopping those people coming here so we have to somehow uh, the planner has to find a way to fit them into existing neighborhoods now we can no longer fit them into industrial areas because they're kind of used up on that note I think the planner also has to be looking at the job space of, of the region and saying uh, we have to protect those industrial areas. There is no constituency for those industrial areas except a few business lobbyists. But they are vital to the health of the city. And we are constantly eroding them. Every time I see a new building, we have an industrial area, I go, there we go. The residential folks have had their way. And we've got one more uh, car repair place or, or parking lot or, or bus depot has to be pushed out of town or to the edge of town to the detriment of the city. Um, the planner has to be a bit of a dreamer and designer. Um, planners were credited with the, sort of the dream of the, the seawall that goes all around the uh, waterfront of the city, which is one of the great triumphs of planning in the city. Um, and they have to be constant negotiators, and, and Marguerite talked, to the, talked about this. Um, because I see so many people here who know so much more about this than I do, I'm going to just close with this. And just uh, say a comment that somebody made about Larry Beasley, who was the consummate negotiator. And uh, no matter whether he was negotiating with council to accept his ideas, or with the neighborhood, or with go with with, with uh, developers, it's been said that when when Larry was negotiating with it, with you, you felt like he was making love with you. And when he finished, <laughs> when he finished, you realized you'd been screwed. <laughs> That's the mark of a great plan. <laughs> okay, Francis Bueller, can you top that? <laughs> no, I really can't. Um, uh, but I will remind everyone that probably um, the person who's going to have one of the biggest say's in choosing the new planner, we don't know who that is because very likely the city manager will be chosen first. Um, and we don't know who that is. And that person will have a big say in who the planner is, uh, more than anyone else. Um, so uh, just you know, a, a reminder about that. Um, and one of the things, you know, obviously, I, you know, a lot of what Peter and Marguerite said are, are sort of the, what I've seen firsthand. One of the things, um, though, just a little story that they didn't tell that I get over and over again with every planner, uh, chief planner I've ever um, reported on, and you know we have lots of <coughs> off the record talks. One of the parts of their job that a lot of people don't realize, um, and I, you know, it's become apparent in some of the criticisms the last few years, but a huge part of their job is saying no to developers who come like, oh, I think I'll buy this industrial land. Any chance of rezoning it? Oh, I think I'll buy this. Uh, and uh, I've had them practically weeping on the phone to me saying, I feel like I can't get anything done. All I do is spend all day on the phone saying, no, you can't do that. Stop it. You know, because uh, if 
the city appears to wobble in any way on some of those issues, it just creates massive land speculation. Uh, you know, and it and it'll always be something different. One year there was, or for a couple of years there was a run on hotels. You know, half the hotel owners in the city were phoning saying, "How about if we convert it to condos?" <coughs> um, and another year it'll be, you know, industrial land. Or uh, it's always changing. Um, it's there, you know, as with like any capitalist system, they're looking at where they can buy cheap and sell high, and um, you know, uh, make a profit. So. Developers are always looking at all of the possibilities in the city and then phoning up the, um, develop, the planning department to say, well, how about if we did this? Um, and I've heard people criticize the planner, chief planner, and the planning department or council saying, oh, well, you approve everything that comes through. You're just patsies. They don't realize that what comes to council is what's already made it through quite a testing process in the planning department. Hopefully, you know, <laughs> if that goes awry. Anyway, I just wanted to remind people that there are four different masters um, that the, pl the head planner has to serve. Uh, one is the public, and there is not a unified public. There's a certain part of the public that is, if I don't get my own way on every issue, then you are a terrible, undemocratic person. Uh, and then there's a different public that is, just tell us what the rules of engagement are. Tell us what you're going to do with our our input, so that we know the limits of what we're able to, you know, uh, how we're able to modify things. Um, and as Peter said, you know, there is a public that doesn't come out to meetings. It doesn't scream and yell and doesn't wait around for three nights to present their opinions at public hearings and. Uh, it's very difficult to know what their true opinions are, and I know that, that the planning department has struggled with how do we really find out what the opinion is. They used to do surveys in the neighborhood, and then that got hijacked by very energetic resident groups who would make sure that their group got in the maximum number of surveys. Uh, so then it became unrepresentative. So the public, um, council, who want the plan that the head planner to achieve their objectives and sometimes extremely aggressive uh, agenda but also don't want them to get council in trouble so somehow they're supposed to push forward a really aggressive agenda but somehow appease all the community groups who don't like it and make sure that council never looks bad or uh, you know comes across as not listening then you have the developers and they're not a unified group um, there's one, I've been talking to people saying I was, you know, coming here to, to speak about this issue and when I talk to people in the development community, I hear really different things. Like one group really wants a planner who will bring a sense of design back to the city. You know, there's been a, a tremendous focus in the last few years on accommodating density, trying to achieve rental, all kinds of things, and there's a sense that design has completely gone by the boards, and I'm sure Frank will be happy to talk about that more. Um, there's another group that just wants certainty on the money and the pro formas. If you're going to make us pay CACs, okay, fine, but can we not have like the 18-month negotiation back and forth where I have no idea what I'm going to pay, uh, and I can't go on the basis of any previous deals because this one might be totally different. Um, the smaller developers feel like they get totally ignored in the city because so much attention is paid to the big me mega developments because those ones deliver, you know, huge CAC dollars and so on. Um, and then finally, there's um, another group that we don't think about, but that's the people inside City Hall, like the, the, the people who work in the planning department and the other departments. and. If you have a planner who doesn't inspire confidence and uh, agreement uh, with inside City Hall, they can't take things very far. And there's a certain amount of disarray that, that clogs up the works. Uh, and I've certainly heard about that over the years. And oddly, you know, I've never seen anyone who can do all of these, uh, I have to say. <laughs> you know, there are some planners who, they're, you, you know, the. The, their uh, their staff love them and the public hates them or vice versa so um, I think uh, just to finish up um, I think some big uh, issues that the new planner is going to have to address is 
do we really need a comprehensive new city plan or do we just need someone who can articulate in a coherent way over and over again what is going on um, because sometimes there are actually very uh, you know well articulated <coughs> plans and objectives but the public doesn't know about them so they're surprised like oh how can you build you know, townhouses in the back of a heritage building, you know, this is a violation of, of the neighborhood plan, and it's actually not. It's something that was written in a long time ago to try to preserve heritage. Um, and I do think um, one of the challenges is going to be trying to figure out how you can communicate authentically with the public, but in a way that people don't feel like, if I just yell the loudest, then I must be the person, our group, is the one that should be listened to. Um, and there needs to be, you know, some new way, some, some innovative ways tried of, of talking to people, trying to solicit the opinions of those who don't come out to meetings, and so on. Um, and yeah, finally this person has to be a saint and also achieve world peace. <laughs> Anybody knows saints who can achieve world peace, please. <laughs> let, let council and the rest of the city know about this. Participants, now it's your turn. Right? I, I only know how to count by three, so I'm going to ask for hands and I'm going to give you numbers. Uh, and then I'll call on you by number and we'll do it three at, uh, three at a time. Uh, and then we'll do uh, another set of three. Uh, please. When you speak, uh, if you aren't too shy about it, I know this is Canada, but uh, give us your full name before you ask your question or make your observation. And uh, I forgot to say earlier, but any of you who brought your lunch, thank you very much. We encourage you to uh, come, when you come to City Conversation, to bring your lunch, to eat it quietly, and, uh, and enjoy. We know that people have a good time here. So with that, Number one, so I'll hand up there. Number two, number three, okay, heavy hitters. My name is Bob Ransford. I think um, Frances had a really insightful comment when she said we don't know how many times the planners say no. And I think the measure of a really good planner is to be able to articulate in a reasoned way or a, a rationale for saying no, and I think the kind of planner that we need in Vancouver right now is someone who has a vision for what to say no to and a reason to say no. I think in the last few years we've been saying no to a lot of things as a reaction to what we're hearing from neighborhoods that have never had to experience change before. Um, it was very easy for uh, Larry Beasley and Anne McAfee because they were seeing a transformation in Vancouver at a time when we were developing brownfield sites and port related sites at the edge of the city where there were no residential neighborhoods or the downtown south area where most of the residences had long left those neighborhoods and they were transforming areas that would bring people into the city when people wanted to see a rebirth of the city and there was no one feeling threatened by that. We've run out of that kind of land now and we've seen the continued same um, pace of growth and we've seen we've experienced growth in waves in Vancouver since the 1880s and those waves come every 15 or 20 years and we're in another one now and we need a planner that actually can articulate a vision and it's not based on design but it's based on how we manage growth it's based on where we're going to put growth in the city and be able to say no because I don't think <coughs> honestly you don't know how many times planners say no, even under the existing policies that we have, not changing policies, but Vancouver has a very unique system and that all of the planning decisions are discretionary basically. There's many conditional uses in most of the zones and there's a lot of discretion that's delegated. If you go to, for instance, Delta or Richmond and places like that, they, the council even is involved in approving development permits. It's not delegated to staff or to the development permit panel or something like that. So. Uh, Vancouver is a unique situation. We need a planner who can say no and explain why they're saying no, and that will tell us what yes means. Thank you. Number two. Yes. Uh, my name is David Gregg, and my question relates to the advice given to the Director of Planning. Um, 
that director would receive advice from the Planning Commission and also from the Advisory Urban Design Panel. So on both of these um, significant influential bodies of um, advisory bodies, the terms of reference would need to be reviewed, in my opinion. The reason for that is in the Vancouver uh, Planning Commission, there's not even a requirement for one single professional person to be on that panel. So I stand corrected, but none of them need be an architect, a planner, or an engineer. So with the advisory design panel, there's not even a planner on the panel. There's someone from the Urban uh, Development Institute, uh, architects, landscape architects, engineers, but not one professional planner. So my question back to any of you that may wish to comment is, do you think that the director of planner, uh, planning should review those terms of reference of those influential bodies, or that should be left to the council? Well, I could start and just uh, question your basic premise that, that, that the planning director takes direction from those two bodies. I think the planning director is over the, what's the planning design, what's it called, the design? Urban design, design panel. panel. Urban design panel. Uh, and isn't, doesn't the planning director sit on that panel? No. No. Well, that's not the one, sorry. No, that's um, the uh, development, development board. board. Thank you. Um, certainly the planning commission, I was on, I've been on the planning commission was originally the planning body for the city before they had a planning department. But now, with all due respect to people, current president, as on the planning commission, it's kind of uh, a group of people looking for a purpose. I mean, they don't really have a, a legislative function and they, they jump in as need be as they, as they try to get ahead and around the planning processes in the city, but nobody has to listen to them. They're uh, advisory <coughs> bodies. Yeah. And the city planning commission is expected to represent citizens, not planners. And they they collect whatever information they can from uh, anybody that's interested, really, and say this is what we think as interested citizens. And the planning director doesn't isn't ordered to follow it. In fact, with the advice is usually supposed to be the council. And it's not intended to be a professional body, and it certainly has no real authority over the director of planning. Yeah, and in about all 20 years of covering council, I can't think of a single time when the planning commission has had any direct impact. I mean, maybe just because of the people who are on it and they're, not, oh, well, there's... I sign up for Yeah, and the urban design panel, I don't think, uh, like, there is, if, if the director or council wanted to, they could overrule the urban design panel, but I think there's a real reluctance to, so there's a bit of a moral authority there or something. Like, I don't, I can't think of a time when the director of planning or council approved a project until the urban design panel had approved it. Now, you know, there's all kinds of conspiracy theories about certain pressures that were brought to bear in certain projects, and we won't name them here, will we? Uh, but, um, <laughs> okay, um, yeah. uh, but, uh, but I think council and the director are very sensitive to, uh, you know, how bad it would look if they went against uh, a vote uh, in the negative at the urban design panel. But the question is... Should there be a planner on it? No. Well, oh. the main question is, should the director of planning review those terms of reference to but I don't balance. think the director of planning has any authority to do that. It would have to be council. My guess would be the director of planning has got enough people coming at him or her that adding one more would just be thick and void that they probably want to. Okay, number three. Um, back in the 50s, Roland Bart wrote about the local mythologies, which is the stories we tell ourselves. It's on the desk of every planner. Exactly. City Hall. There's a mythology that's grown up in the city about the importance, role, and power of city planners, and I'd like to really seriously contest it. This is the, uh, one of at least three full board sessions devoted to the search for the new planner. Planners have a role here like movie stars do in LA or philanthropists and bankers do in New York. And I do think we need to question this as part of this. To respect this process, we have to question it. I think we had one truly visionary planner in Ray Paxman. We had a superb communicator in Larry Beasley. Uh, we have a landscape now where I don't think, what, no matter what the CV, 
I don't think we could have the kind of success um, equal to the, to the expectations. I think we should be instead having a talk about how we've developed a city that has a developer's party of the right and a developer's party of the left. Why, we, uh, why the city has, you know, Francis and Jeff and Handel for others, but a very, very passive media environment uh, where things go in question. I've been to Toronto, Calgary, even Edmonton, and see more debate about decisions, etc. I think we're missing the boat. The search for the super planner is a fool's game. Yeah. Now, having said that, uh, my vote. <laughs> Jennifer Kiesman in Toronto is getting murdered from the mayor at one side and getting murdered She's by her own staff on the other. I think she'd be as close to perfection as I could cope up. So I'm not so <laughs> <laughs> well, what is your yeah. answer? <laughs> <laughs> True. Yes. Well, you didn't do it. Please Jennifer. Is there a great. I mean, it's true. It's true that the planner has as much leeway as council and the city manager give that planner. And I know Larry used to get reined in from time to time. Um, you know, can you just stop lobbying so much in public? Thank you very much. Um, so uh, you know, it does depend uh, very much on the, the, the environment that they're working in. Um, but I. I mean, I see the, the focus on the planner as part of the huge interest that Vancouver has in design and planning. This is the only city, I think, where you get 600 people out on a June evening to listen to Andres Duaney talk about, you know, the ecosystems of suburbanism versus urbanism. Like, I can't think of another city where that many people would show up. There's just a huge interest. And yeah, and part of that is investing a bit too much magical power in the in the planet. Well, I guess my main point is that we should try to get the story right. In other words, question mythology. And for example, Jim Shank's role in the development of Vancouver's Tower mm -hmm. pushed aside and politicians and planners to take credit for it. Well, I think history will of the truth eventually. But I think we, we have bought into a mythology that is hard on the planners who to get that job. I've Their actually read recently a completely revisionist thing that it was Richard Henriquez who laid the groundwork okay. for Jim yeah. Chang. That's not but that's, you know, that's... It's actually been common. My four, five, and six, please. Oh, well, here they before are. Four, on. five, and six. Before you go on, can we please, following your uh, initial outline, we have the name of uh, yes. number three. The Trevor Boney, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Trevor. Thank you. And Michael, Marguerite just tried to point. Yeah, could you repeat your question? You're talking about what things look like, not how they work. I mean, Vancouver works, and I always have. What happens as we change it, somebody needs to know. And I, I think that a director of planning can. Certainly, Ray understood how cities work. And that was a very important factor. I mean, Vancouver works. It may not always work. We've got 50% of the population living on the 30th story. Will we have the same city? We don't know. Mm -hmm. I certainly don't know. And the, and the current something. The council undoubtedly doesn't know, but we need to understand before we actually do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, number four. Uh, number four? Yeah. Frank yes. Ducote, uh, former Your urban name? designer. Frank Ducote, form, former urban designer of the city and also member of the planning commission at the time. Uh, Francis did a, an interesting point. Is there a need for a new city plan? Um, the city plan came along before we had regional context statements. And theoretically, the regional context statements for all municipalities in the region say how much of the population, how much of the jobs you're going to take in your share of the, uh, of the larger region. Um, because city plan preceded the regional context statement, it seemed to be there was a real opportunity, had they been reversed, to say, okay, we have this growth potential here, jobs and, and, and units and people. But we don't know how to allocate those things. We're going to send planners forward in the neighborhoods and do a plan, and it'll be driven by capacity analysis. It'll be driven by vacant sites or whatever, underutilized sites. I did one in Oak Ridge Lane era back in the day, and Francis remembers that in the mid 90s. Um, but we never said to a neighborhood, your share of the regional context to take X thousands of people in the city over the next 20 years is why? Right. And Except Grandview Woodlands. 
They got I'm going to speak to them. <laughs> and maybe they were told that, I don't know. <coughs> and question, if you were told that in Dunbar or the West Side or West Point or something, is based on the amenities capacity that you might have future, present and future transit uh, job, uh, excuse me, school seats, any number of factors you want to say into a capacity, it's, they're not all the same. You don't get one twentieth of the, of the growth, but you get your share of the growth, whatever that is, based on factors. We never told people that. And so they were able to say no to us because they didn't want to take You mean in, 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 in the, the city, city plan, plan or in the, in the city plan, plan process, right. they were essentially able to say no. Mm -hmm. We want a hell of a lot of amenities, but we want nothing more than four stories. So um, I think that missing piece about your share, and then the question becomes how? You take it in townhouses, anyway houses, or whatever else. I don't know if mm -hmm. with the former counselors or friends that you think about that. I thought there step, were some numbers Which is sort of a vision for the plans. whole city, but yeah. not necessarily a city plan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, that's, that's a good point. Uh, and I think some of the angst about development in the, in the region, yes, comes because we're going through a wave of growth mixed in with some other factors that make people anxious. But also I do think it's the regional growth strategy that had specific numbers and then allocated specific, specific numbers to municipalities. Right. Some of them argued for more. <laughs> um, that has propelled some of the resistance. Is, you know, people sort of accepted growth when it was just happening, but suddenly when they feel like there's a quota, I feel like there's more resistance. I, I would beg to differ with that because mm -hmm. I think you said earlier, just lay down the rules and we'll work within them. And mm -hmm. I think if people knew this is what we have to do, very difficult discussion to have, you know, because who decides which neighborhood gets what? They won't be the neighborhoods because they get to decide how they fit them in. Or maybe they would have, but we'll take a lot but of We're not disagreeing. I totally agree with that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I, here's, if, it, if, if it's inevitable, people will ultimately accept it. They may resist at the beginning, but people understand. I mean, it, all kinds of areas of Vancouver have now accepted main houses. The first main house created a riot. I mean, people didn't get the idea. They didn't think it was important. And they sweet, so it was the same and, thing. And, and, and uh, when, when our council approved a small wedge of land in Point Grey, the, the land was stratted, the houses were single family, and I voted for it. I got hell from the Northwest Point Grey Homeowners Association, because that was a pure RS1. Mm -hmm. It had to be sick. Well, that wouldn't happen now. I mean, they've accepted the basement suites and yeah. main houses. And but Frank's point about if we said Vancouver's, a, you know, agreed that growth inevitably is going to bring this many people. Here's Vancouver's part of it, and here's how we're going to allocate it in the neighborhoods. Here's the rationale for how we're going to allocate it. Uh, and then it's going to be up to neighborhoods at different points to say how, how are we going to accommodate that. But yeah, only some neighborhoods have heard the num the magic number and others haven't. Yeah. But it takes time. People have to take time to adjust yeah. to the idea. I just want to quote from City Plan about on this on this thing. Even with growth, that's the that's the acknowledgement we have to grow. Vancouver will keep much of what gives its neighborhoods their look and feel. Trees and greenery, heritage buildings, distinctive area identities, generally low scale buildings outside the central area. <laughs> So that's right, and it was constantly called up whenever we came to some project we come up neighbor. Well, look, we already agreed on city plan. We're, we're going to keep it the way it is. We'll give or take a few Granville Island type amenities. Number five, please. Thank you. My name's Dorothy Barkley, and I'm the chair of the Granville Woodlands Area Council. I sat on the Citizens Assembly, and I'm co-chair of the Coalition of Vancouver Neighborhoods. We've been focused on what's been going on for so long, and Francis, I disagree completely. Within the Citizens' Assembly, everyone was crying out for context. How do we fit into the city? How do, what are the other neighborhoods doing? What's the rationale for what needs to happen? We couldn't even get a number as to what the densification was. There was just this underlying theme that you needed to take densification, whatever that may be. Generally, it involved a lot of height. And with regards to UDP, I would urge that there should be someone, it could be an architect, it could be a landscape architect, whatever, there should always be someone from the neighborhood. Because UDP, when they look at what's going on in these neighborhoods, 
It's an academic process that does not touch on them or their lives or their neighborhoods. Uh, I haven't seen it happen. <coughs> so I would suggest that if I could ask for anything from the new city platter, we recognize there's a role for the development community for the city and its goals, but the residents need to be consulted and there needs to be a city plan, a comprehensive plan that explains why we need to take how much growth and how it's to be apportioned and not to leave the residents out there and just floundering. This gets to Patrick Condon's point uh, that Vancouver is the only city in the region without an, offic uh, an official community plan. And why is that? Are we that special and different that we can't come up with one? Everybody else has one. And then the rules are laid out and we know there will be growth here and density here and so on. And we don't have all these developer-driven initiatives to throw all the things <coughs> into a tailspin because where did this come from? Some development proposal dropped out of the sky or headed into the sky and now we've all got to adapt to it. Number six, please. Who was number six? Okay, we're going to call for a new number six. Mm -hmm. Number six. Okay, great. Adrian Carr, City Councilor. Um, and by the way, I was a graduate student of Walter Hardwick when he was a, uh, a city councilor. <coughs> and I heard endlessly from him complaints about staff, that this was a council with lots of vision and staff had too much power. So in this last election, I think um, that planning did become political. And what we heard from citizens is the concern that staff had too much power, council had too much power, developers had too much power, but the citizens didn't. So how would you, in thinking about a new planner, chief planning for the city, how would you frame the need to focus on giving the people some piece of that power that they are obviously desiring? And how does the planner, chief of planning, actually balance that, the direction of the department, with the will of council on that issue? With the will of council? With yeah, the will with of it. the people in the neighborhood? I uh, know that I'm saying if they are appealing to the people, how do how do they how does how do the planners deal with council and whatever council wants in terms of public participation? If it's different from what if the it's different from, from what the people want or the plan or the the people want or the planner himself or herself. There's no science to this. It, you, you've almost got to make it up for each project you have different issues that raise, arouse different parts of different neighborhoods and different levels of emotion. And but I think the thing is that you've got to be willing to do that. You, you've got, and you've got to give them a chance. As a matter of fact, we mentioned Mary Deasy. Mary Deasy was a phenomenally good local area planner when she was young, big yes, beginning. We had a huge committee in Middle Mountain that ranged from Grace, Grace McCarthy's constituency president to the local uh, Marxist Leninist candidate, and everybody came, and everybody had a say, and it went on for ages. But uh, but in the end, it transformed that community. It it really made a huge difference. But it took a long time, and it took Larry knowing how to keep these people going and to hear what they had to say. It went on for quite a while. I don't think you can hurry it if you're actually trying to hear what people say. Perhaps they could go to Granby Woodlands and the Citizens Assembly and say, what have we learned? Because that's been a very long, painful, and deeply thought out process. There and must be some lessons out of that. I mean, I, and I just have to say, my concern is after covering more awful public hearings than I care to mention, more than you ever went to. <laughs> Just because he was only on for a certain number of years, I mean, not not that he wasn't at all. <laughs> um, but uh, there are so many people in this city we do not hear from. So, what does it mean when you say you're listening? Does it mean you listen to the people who come to council and <coughs> start screaming, or is it other people who maybe never come to council? You know, there were a lot of people who crapped all over um, the city's STIR rental program. Uh, those buildings are now filled with very grateful people who get a chance to rent a new apartment instead of a basement suite, um, you know, near transit and so on. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, they never showed up at any meetings. They're just happy they have, like, a, uh, there, there's so much rental now, or not so much, but, you know, at least a little bit more rental available in Vancouver that, than used to be. So uh, that is my concern about the whole public listening part. Who are you listening to? Well, that actually raises a question that I've been asking for about a year now, which is when we have public participation, the people who come are the people who are already here. Who speaks for the people who want to be here, but aren't here yet, and therefore don't have a voice? Or or even because they can't afford the housing prices. You know, some money to pay. Whether, whether it's because they can't afford the housing price, or whether, whether, whether uh, like with rental, housing simply isn't available. Yeah. Who speaks for them in these plans? OK, we're, um, I throw that out as a rhetorical question. Uh, hands, please, for number seven. Big hand up there for number seven to eight. And sorry, Andy. Yeah, Andy's got his hand up. He's bashful. Andy, eight. Sorry, uh, and number nine. Back there. Okay, number seven, please. Okay. And your so name? first of all, in the rental, um, it would your be nice the city when they're making your name, decisions. Your name, please. Mm -hmm. Don Gardner. Thank you. Uh, when the city is making decisions, they actually have statistics and information in front of them. Over 35% of condo buildings, stratas, are rental. They don't include that in stock. So they're giving away density, they're giving away all kinds of things to build rentals when they're already there. So, I mean, you got to have all the facts when you're making decisions. Second thing is, uh, we went through, in the Mount Pleasant plan, we spent five years developing a Mount Pleasant plan. There was density that had to be taken. We looked at options. We got to a point where you, we were told the only way you can do it is put in towers. We went out, brought the community together, did a charrette, and proved that we could take all of the density without building anything over four stories. That was completely ignored by the city and by plan. So if you're going to get a new plan, you know, one of the frustrating things when you look at Vancouver Sun had a big article on the current planner saying his city. It's not his city, it's our city. So we need a planner who's going to listen to the community. So just on that, I do agree about the Mount Pleasant plan. It's also one of the reasons that I'm not so crazy about developing a city plan. They spent three or four years developing the Mount Pleasant plan. And the very first building that was proposed everyone started arguing and saying this isn't what the plan was about. So I'm not convinced that a plan is going to solve problems. But one of the problems there is that, and I said it when the plan came out, yeah. basically it wasn't worth the paper it's written on. None of, none, of the, none of the community plans are, because the city has so many diverse policies that they can come along and say, oh, this is STIR 100, oh, no, that plan doesn't apply here. We're going to put this spot rezoning in that spot and ignore the plan. And they've done that over and over again. So you need a city plan. You need to understand how it's going to work. You need to know what... If a neighborhood plan you spent three years on didn't work, how is the city plan going to work? The only reason it didn't work is because it came along and overrode the plan. They overrode the plan. Okay. If they had stuck by the plan, there wouldn't have been a problem. Did council accept, did council pass the plan, or was it? Yes, and then they ignored it. Isn't that no, what happened in Grandview Woodlands? Pardon me? Isn't that what happened in Grandview Woodlands? No, there's so no plan yet. Well, that was, they have, they have that was the making of the plan. But, but anyway, there's... the problem with the Mount Pleasant plan is when it was passed, all the residents were like, yeah, this is great, we really like it. And then the minute the first building came along, people started to disagree about what uh, actually the consensus had been. And I think there was legitimate confusion on the part of residents who said, wait a minute, yes, we said we'll take some density. We didn't say a 26-story tower exactly. at Kingsway and Broadway. Just on your rental point, though, I think you're, if I can respectfully say, I think you're a little bit wrong there. CMHC does now look at the rentals in condos that is factored in. Uh, when the city is looking at how much rental is available in the city? Well, I've been at public hearings at the city. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 
we get to we'll talk about later. Yeah. Sorry, number eight, please. I guess <clears throat> I guess that's me. I'm Andy Yan. Yeah. I'm a, I'm an urban planner as well as a member of the city planning commission. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll I'll leave it fairly simple. Is that perhaps um, there's a line that um, the the Titanic was built by professionals, the Ark was built by amateurs. So that I'm, I'm curious that in your, I mean, in, in your discussion of who the next planner would be, that it's been, I think the general regional context plan comes into how, the, and by 2040, Vancouver is supposed to grow by 120,000 people. That how would you see that 120,000 people who aren't here to show up to a public meeting, who aren't here to advocate? should be allocated. You mean among the neighborhoods? Yeah. I want to go back to Patrick Condon. Didn't he work that all out for the whole region? Yeah, we can put them all down these corridors and <laughs> fit them all in. We don't have to have that many big towers or whatever it was. Yeah, There's one that's if every single landowner on an arteria was raised to redevelop. Oh, that's Dunbar whether they're going to put those. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that's <laughs> the next phase of the discussion, of course. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's just like people saying, oh, there's all this zone capacity in Vancouver. We don't need to rezone anything. Well, you just, you don't have to be here very long to understand that no matter what the zoning is, not every owner is going to build to the max. I could tear down my heritage house and build a duplex. I'm not going to do it. So, you know, and many small owners on, on arterials are not interested in redeveloping for whatever reason. A lot of them can be persuaded by developers if they have no other options. Maybe we should start charging for people leaving buildings empty. Mm. Yes. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody got an actual count of how many there are? Empty what? Empty, empty buildings? The last I heard was 14. Well, there's no data. There's no data. Okay. 14. Anyway, but um, I, 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 whoever it was who said it, um, someone who was talking about if you're going to allocate it, you can't just sort of go by the square kilometers or whatever. You have to look at the amenities in the area and allocate it that way, which, who was saying that? Was it you? Or? Oh, Frank, yeah. Uh, and what about listening to the communities? Maybe some say, yeah, we're happy with it. I want to age in place. So I need it someplace nearby. And others say, no way. And maybe there could be some happy compromise. Maybe. Yeah, I, it certainly can't be just by, you know, square kilometer or something like that. I just want to throw another thing that hasn't been said yet about uh, neighborhood participation and people speaking and citizens engagement. Now, half, more than half the people in the city do not have English as their first language. They are not comfortable talking in public meetings. Their voices are very hard to be heard. And uh, somehow the new planner has to get them into the picture too. Mm -hmm. Okay. On that note, we have to stop because it's 1.30. First of all, I want to thank our uh, presenters. And we have uh, some uh, little gifts for you. Uh, let's give them all a... Uh,